This brings us to components of lung recoil. It is very important to note that lung recoil is inversely related to compliance. If recoil increases, compliance decreases and it is difficult to stretch such lung. If recoil decreases, compliance increases and it will be easy to stretch the lung, therefore also reducing the effort required by the respiratory muscles to expand the lungs. Lung recoil is composed of two following components, the tissue itself and the surface tension forces. First, let's talk about the tissue itself. The lung tissue is composed of collagen and elastin fibers. Therefore, it is very elastic tissue. When a lung expands, this stretches the collagen and elastin fibers and increases the force of the lung which tries to collapse it like a rubber band returning to its original shape after you stretch it. This force is called recoil force. The larger the lung, the more tissue is stretching and the greater the recoil force which acts inward trying to collapse the lung. In clinical practice, in case of emphysema, often caused by smoking, Smoke stimulates the neutrophils and macrophages to produce more protease. This leads to protease-antiprotease imbalance. There would be more elastase than alpha-1 antitrypsin. Elastase attacks the elastin fibers and results in a destruction of parenchyma, alveolar receptor, and capillaries. The air spaces enlarge because of air trapping. In addition, elastic recoil decreases because of elastin destruction by elastase. As a consequence, the lung will be easily stretched and compliance increases. This is the reason why the patients with any type of obstructive pulmonary diseases have no significant problem with inspiration, rather they have trouble with expiration. Also, in clinical practice, in case of fibrosis, we have an increased collagen fiber deposition in the lung, which increases the tissue component of elastic recoil. Increased recoil means the lung is more stiff and it is difficult to stretch it. Thus, compliance decreases. You know that compliance is related to the effort required to expand the lungs to overcome recoil. This is the main reason why the patients with fibrosis have trouble with inspiration and not expiration because the lung is difficult to stretch but easily deflated. The second and important component of lung recoil is the surface tension force. In order to explain the surface tension force, let me draw here a lung and the alveoli. It is very important to know that in an alveolus, there is a fluid lining the alveolar surface. Let me remove a piece of alveolus and draw it here. It is very important to note that water molecules lining the alveolar surface behave different to each other depending upon their localization. The behavior of water molecules in a deeper layer is different when compared with water molecules on a surface. The deeper located water molecule is attracting in all directions with other water molecules. However, on a surface, the water molecules are not attracted to all directions with surrounding water molecules because there is a liquid air interface here. The water molecules on a surface will be pulled by the innermost molecules inward. As a consequence, the surface will shrink and the surface area reduces. Reducing the surface area develops a force which is called the surface tension force. Surface tension forces tend to reduce the area on the surface and generate a pressure. Let's apply this concept to the whole alveolus. If the water molecules will be pulled by deeper molecules, the surface area reduces. This generates a force or pressure trying to collapse the alveolus. If all alveoli behave in such manner, there would be great force trying to collapse the lung. 
Therefore, these forces contribute to lung recoil. It is extremely important to note that the surface tension force is the greatest component of lung recoil. This force is much greater than lung tissue itself, which also contributes to recoil. In order to understand how great the surface tension force is, let's fill the alveoli with saline. In a case of the saline solution filled lungs, there is no air fluid interface. Thus, in a saline filled lung, the main recoil force, surface tension force, is not present. There is only tissue elastic force. Therefore, it is easily stretched lung. Compliance increases. Now let's talk about the collapsing pressure created by surface tension forces in a little bit more detail. Suppose this is an alveolus and I block it, that air cannot leave it. If the air passages leading from the alveoli of the lungs are blocked, the surface tension force in an alveolus tends to collapse the alveolus. This creates positive pressure in the alveolus attempting to push the air out. This pressure is called collapsing pressure. The amount of pressure generated in this way in the alveolus is dependent on two things. The magnitude of surface tension force and the alveolar radius. First, let's see how the collapsing pressure depends on magnitude of surface tension forces. I will draw here two alveoli with the same size, same radius. Suppose the first alveolus generates more surface tension forces when compared with the second alveolus. It is very important to note that the collapsing pressure is directly proportional to surface tension forces. You increase the surface tension forces, it increases the collapsing pressure. You decrease the surface tension forces, it decreases the pressure. The first alveolus has higher surface tension force and therefore it tends to collapse the alveoli to a greater degree and generates more collapsing pressure. Inversely, the second alveolus has less surface tension forces and therefore generates less collapsing force when compared to the first alveolus. To sum it up, two alveoli with the same radius and different surface tension forces generate different collapsing pressure. The greater the surface tension forces, the greater the collapsing pressure. The second factor affecting collapsing pressure in alveoli is radius of the alveolus. Now let's see how the alveolar radius affects the collapsing pressure. Again, let me here draw two alveoli. In this case, suppose both have the same surface tension forces and only different is the size, the radius. The radius of first alveolus is greater than second. It is very important to know that the pressure in alveolus is inversely proportional to radius. You increase the radius, the pressure decreases. You decrease the radius, it increases the pressure. Thus, because the radius of the first alveolus is greater than the second, it generates less pressure. On the other hand, because the second alveolus has lesser radius, it generates more collapsing pressure when compared to large alveolus. This concludes, large alveoli have low collapsing pressures and are very easy to keep open. Small alveoli have high collapsing pressure and are more difficult to keep open. Thus, the small alveoli have the great tendency to collapse, creating the regions of atelectasis. The relationship between the surface tension force and a pressure inside a bubble is given by the law of Laplace which says a collapsing pressure is directly proportional to surface tension and inversely proportional to alveolar radius. Although the situation is more complex in a lung, 
it follows that small alveoli tend to be unstable. They have a great tendency to collapse, creating regions of atelectasis. Let's see how. I will draw two alveoli connected to each other. Suppose they have different radius, but the surface tension force are equal. According to the Laplace's law, the collapsing pressure is directly proportional to surface tension and inversely proportional to alveolar radius. Both have the same surface tension forces, but the radius of the first alveolus is large and the second is small. So according to Laplace, as you increase the radius, the collapsing pressure decreases. And as you decrease the radius, the collapsing pressure increases. In this case, the small alveolus generates greater collapsing force and pushes the air out and empties to the large alveolus. As a result, it collapses, creating regions of atelectasis. To sum it up, increased surface tension forces creates three problems. First, it creates regions of atelectasis. This happens because small alveoli have a great tendency to empty into large alveoli and collapse. Second, the long recoil increases. When a recoil force which tries to collapse the lung increases, this leads to decreasing compliance. This happens because the surface tension forces collapse the alveoli and it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to expand such a lung. Third, in addition, increased surface tension force causes pulmonary edema. This happens when the alveoli collapse and recoil increases. This leads to decreasing pleural pressure becoming even more negative and transmitted to the pulmonary capillaries. Because of this negative pressure, the fluid will be sucked from the blood and interstitium to the alveoli. If the surface tension forces were not solved, then lung recoil would be so great that lungs theoretically should not be able to inflate. It is extremely important to know that under normal conditions, all these problems are prevented by producing only one substance, and this substance is called surfactant. Surfactant is a surface active agent in water, which means that it greatly reduces the surface tension force in alveoli. Let's talk about surfactant in a little bit more detail. It is very important to know that alveoli are lined by two types of epithelial cells, type 1 and type 2 cells. Type 1 epithelial cells are composed of more than 90% of the surface area. The squamous structure is adapted for gas diffusion across the alveolar capillary membrane. Type 2 epithelial cells are cuboidal cells and secrete surfactant. Surfactant is a complex lipoprotein composed of hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. Hydrophilic regions of the phospholipid are oriented toward the epithelial surface and dissolved in a liquid, and hydrophobic regions are facing the lumen. Surfactant interacts with water molecules on the surface in such a way that its presence does not allow them to be pulled by neighboring water molecules and does not allow the surface area to reduce. This results in three important properties of surfactant. First, surfactant lowers the surface tension forces in alveoli. Thus, in its way, surfactant lowers recoil and increases the compliance of the lung. Second, in two different sizes of alveoli, surfactant decreases the surface tension more in a small alveolus and prevents collapsing of the small alveolus. This occurs because surfactant covers more of the total surface area of a small alveolus than a large alveolus. Third, 
Surfactant prevents pulmonary edema from developing. Because surfactant reduces the recoil force, pleural pressure is close to atmospheric. It is negative 5 cm water. A pleural pressure of negative 5 cm water is not transmitted to the pulmonary capillaries. It is not a force promoting pulmonary edema. In clinical practice, there are some diseases related to surfactant. Respiratory distress syndrome is a disease in which there is a problem with surfactant applying. There are two forms of that, infant respiratory distress syndrome and adult respiratory distress syndrome. It is very important to note that the type 2 alveolar cells start producing surfactant at gestational week 24 and is almost always present by gestational week 35. Infant respiratory distress syndrome can occur in a premature infants because of the lack of surfactant. Without surfactant, the negative pressure required to inflate the lungs is very high. It should reach negative 40 to negative 100 cm water, and an infant, of course, cannot produce such great negative pleural pressure. Thus, portions of the lung collapse, leading to respiratory distress and potential respiratory failure and death. In diagnosing, fetal amniotic fluid can be measured for lecithin and sphingomyelin content, the ratio of which can serve as an indicator of fetal lung maturity. A ratio of less than 1.5 is a strong predictor of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. Treatment consists of ventilatory support and surfactant therapy through the breathing tube. Respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn can sometimes be prevented if labor can be delayed and if corticosteroids are used to mature the lung. Infant respiratory distress syndrome is also called hyaline membrane disease. As for the adult respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, it is an acute injury to the alveolar membrane. There are a lot of causes of ARDS. It is important to know that they mainly cause ARDS via two ways, via bloodstream and airway. For example, sepsis causes injury to the pulmonary capillary endothelium, leading to interstitial edema and increased lymph flow. In addition, the neutrophils leak out of the capillary into the interstitium. These neutrophils cause damage to the alveolar membrane, and interstitial proteins with fluid leak out to the alveoli, and pulmonary edema develops. In addition, the protein seepage into the alveoli reduces the effectiveness of surfactant. In case of gastric aspiration, we have a direct injury to the alveolar epithelium via the airway. This causes the increased permeability of alveolar membrane. As such, interstitial proteins enter the alveolus and carry water with them. As a result, pulmonary edema develops. This brings us to the lung inflation curves as seen in a case of surfactant deficiency. In y-axis, we have the lung volume, and in x-axis, we have the pleural pressure. When you decrease the pleural pressure more negative, the lung expands and lung volume increases. So under normal conditions, we get this curve. In case of respiratory distress syndrome, a greater change in intrapleural pressure is required to inflate the lungs. In order to expand the lung, first you have to decrease the negative pleural pressure even more negative. You start decreasing the pressure even more negative and only then will the lung begin inflating and the volume increasing. We get this curve shifted to the right. And it is a flatter curve because the lung stiffens. In case of atelectasis, the alveoli are collapsed and therefore in order to open them, 
you need to decrease the pore pressure more negative. You continue decreasing pressure and only at this point the alveoli open and air flows to the lung and the lung volume increases. This is how the curve will look like in the case of atelectasis.